Thank you, everybody, for being here. This is our next panel presentation. We have Jennifer Guantoyolo, is a writer and doctoral student at Texas Tech University, where she currently pursues a PhD in English and serves as managing editor of Iron Horse Literary Review. Her stories, essays, and translations have appeared in Denver Quarterly, Newfound, Los Angeles Review, Texas Review, and elsewhere. We also have um, Lisa Levine. Lisa Levine's fiction and nonfiction have appeared in Manifest West, The Furious Gazelle, Birds, Thumb, and Cut Bank. And her short story, Shelter, was a 2014 Pushcart nominee. She teaches writing at Presidio School, the University of Arizona, Southern New Hampshire University, and elsewhere, is an, and is assistant fiction editor for Train.org. The story I'll read um, treads lightly, as people must do when entering a cave. It's called The Darkest. Brace your arms against both sides, where there's nothing to hold on to. Joy. My butt slid off the ledge, and I placed a tentative foot out against one side of the horizontal stem, two blank walls of limestone. My seat felt comfortable, indolent. I wanted to stay here and hang out, tell jokes and work up to the move, but my friends were quick. My extended leg wobbled. Ahead, Joy's boyfriend, Harsh, waited, face distant as the ripples of full moon reflected in running water. He didn't look worried about me. Maybe my uncertainty stayed more concealed than I thought it did. It felt like every move I made was too weak to work the gravity-defying magic that I knew it would if I tried hard and trusted enough. Possibly, Harsh didn't care to worry about my balance, but that was an ugly thought, down in this cave with the two of them. Frozen, unsure of the next move, I felt my leg grip, and I knew I had to make a decision. I flexed my other foot, the one still planted on solid ground, slowed my breath, and tried again to scooch out into the chasm below by repositioning my grip and working weight against both sides of the rock. But when I tried to move into the last few, a few inches, nothing happened. I just couldn't go. Joy watched me, hawk-like. Before she could offer some idea that I'd have to try, I slid back to solid ground and tried to unclench. I'm not feeling this, I said. I might wait here. She narrowed her eyes, her smile bobbing from behind the poly blend of Harsh's mud-caked plaid shirt. No, she said. You can do it. Joy in her pastel helmet, Harsh's perfect face. Down here, they knew who they were. I can, I lied. I'm not sure if it's worth it, though. I'm really more interested in that last room. I can wait for you two back there. I gestured with my gloved hand, brushing the wall, and then patting it, apologetic to the lost shards of crystal for all they cared about being damaged. Harsh raised one of his eyebrows. I don't think we should split up, he said, his body still half facing the dark ahead. Joy had moved into it. I shook my head. It's 15 feet away, and you guys have to come back out this route. I'll wait. I'd have said, just don't die. But with his girlfriend already off again into the blackness, that didn't seem funny even inside my head. I'll wait down at the cavern before the last climb, I said again. Harsh nodded. Got it. And he was gone. I was alone in the dark. We should have stayed together with only three of us, and we knew this, but neither he nor she nor I suggested it. I beamed my headlamp into the space where they disappeared, watching the light dwindle into ink, resting my spine against the rock and listening to the fast fading thuds and murmurs. Then I turned to face my way back down the tunnel. Solo, the down climb they had talked me through felt familiar and awkward. With only my headlamp, I had to pause at every step to shine light down to see the footholds, think it out, then look back up as I took the step. But here, with no imminent risk of death if I slipped, my points of contact and my psyche stayed solid. My climb. The first part involved what I can only describe as a slinky move between upper and lower body. The lower half of me sprang one direction and the other half stretched opposite ways, this to avoid a massive chunk of inverted limestone where the down climb opened itself. 
Once I got my feet lower and my body, my upper body passed the chunk, there came a series of delicate stair steps. Alone, there was no margin for error, but no pressure to perform. I had no reason for a fall, and I didn't waver. At the bottom of my small solo victory, I'd entered a cave cavern, a room. I looked around. There were gaps below my feet, but none so large as to be dangerous, just dark spaces between rocks. I found the, the rock seat where Harsh had taken pictures of joy in me. I rested. For the first time since I passed the snake outside Bell's locked grate, I realized how sore and tired my arms and legs had become from bracing themselves and twisting around strange shapes. Shining light all around me, I admired cavern walls knobby and whorled with layers of seep and drip, abstract formations and dirty crystal blooms, understated beauty. No spectacular gift shop columns, no dramatic spires or ice cream towers of water-smoothed flowstone, just insane limestone shards clinging, slipping, shifting underground, an ordinary cave. Joy maybe would have explored, but I wasn't bold like her. Instead, I tilted my head back, resting on my helmet, looked around and listened. Silence. During my down climb, I had been working too hard to observe the absence of sound. Now, at rest, I heard not, nothing at all, not one noise. No affectionate drumbeat pounded out by hands I almost knew, no laughter, no random half-caught words, no sirens, no electronic hum. Nothing sounded in this place. I liked it. The caving adventure started with drama, not calm. The entrance required a short down climb, and as I moved into it from above, I heard branches snapping. Looked to see Joy clearing brush from around her face. She squinted at me and cried out, Juniper, there's a snake by your hand. I narrowed my eyes like her, looking at my hand. Only leaves. Shut up, I wanted to tell her. Don't see danger and it won't see you. I trusted her, but for the drive out here, I'd regretted their offer of a ride. I had wanted to think the day out for myself without feeling trapped inside the stupid jokes and chatter in the vacuum of their back seat. Too bad for me. She saw into the leafage as well as she did logistics, because when I shifted my hand an inch to the left, I saw a flash of dry patterned skin shift with me. Solo, I never would have taken the time to find this place. Before I followed their bumper to dirt, still on the interstate, the swerve and flow of traffic and high tension talk kept my mind jumping. But on the dirt road, among trees and the occasional flit of animal movement, I had no padding against her expertise. She knew her stuff. It was the way she beat me over the head with it I couldn't abide. So much so that at the entrance, unwilling to wait for her, I started in, I started in the wrong way. Holding myself outward, with my arms wrapped around the limestone knob close to the nest of dry oak leaves where that snake lay coiled and silent. Having made my rotten choice, I stuck with it. I stopped when she yelled my name, but my body didn't react. It's not rattling, Harsh muttered. You can see it too? I asked, and as we spoke, my hand slid down the rock face. My foot found a lower hold. I skittered, where there was no more rock and no more snake, jumping to the ground with muscle and earth reverberating in my knees. I couldn't do that. Just don't jump once we're inside, Joy said. Her knees were shot. High school team sports laid to rest at her adult doorstep. She moved in methodical, wary steps. Didn't want to wait, I smiled, dusting off my scraped palms, shaking off the down climb sensation of loose gravel turning to water under my feet and solidifying again. That wasn't the best way, Harsh said, but it worked. Unwinding static rope, they descended west to avoid my east-dwelling snake. It was coiled, body tense and sleek, but no rattle sounded from within the leaves as we passed out of striking range. Hope he's not there when we come out. Caves breathe. Although Joy stopped scribbling our names in the exit lock just inside the grate long enough to tell us that the shifts in air temperature and pressure along the first long passageway were carbon pressure from outside, they were, to me, exhalation. The cave wants us to leave, I said. Harsh laughed, but Joy said, no, it's carbon pressure. So outside wants us to stay in. I tried to keep it light. She shook her head and pointed a gloved finger at the wall, where our headlamps lit up sections of muddy white mineral that sparkled, maybe with pyrite. I think that's frost work. Harsh rolled his eyes, but she didn't see it. 
Should we look at our route, he asked, just to make sure. Last time, oh, I know, Joyce said, looking at me. We looked for this place, but we didn't have any descriptions, and we ended up on, like, three different routes. I mean, it was fun. She stopped looking at me, unfolded a scrap of paper, unfolding a scrap of paper from her pocket. But we wasted too much time. Arsh held her hand still and looked at the paper, scribbled with arrows and notes. He said to look for a huge mass of flowstone, like this. She clicked through her camera. He nodded, and we started, Joy in lead. Her pace, steady without pause, granted permission to take in the descending landscape. The rippled panels of limestone wall gave way to slippery, round formations, undecorated and difficult to hold. Three points of contact, Harsh reminded me when I slipped, and I pushed back against the rock, regaining balance. My steps tightroped from one firm place to another in a path as random as the arrangement of solid formations below our muddy boots. Although I wouldn't notice any soreness until a seemingly insane amount of time later, unknown muscles, core and limb, worked to maintain the pace and keep me stable between dark gaps of empty cave space. In the darkness, amid fluctuations in air weight and pressure, amid space where nothing contoured out into a palm or foot, we reached for every fraction of stability. Any one of us could fall. An injury could happen. Even with Joy's sense of adventure and Harsh's geology degree, here underground amid this unreal accumulation of drips and pipes and stems and drabs of mineral earth, our collective plans and measurements and equipment could fall short. Our delicate bird wing bones haunted my thoughts as our surroundings grew more otherworldly, my headlamp beaming white light across encrusted knobs, million-sided crystals, drip-thin pipes moistening into life from above and below. I felt panic rise, subside, and rise again. Still, their experience, not beauty, overrode my fetal worry. I followed, treading on moist rock without hesitation, only because that was how they took in the cave, harsh and joy, as if its potential dangers were best overcome by turning a blind eye. I followed their lead. From the start, we were bare bones, three of us the minimum to safely enter. Although we didn't talk about who would do what along the way, Someone would have to lead, and other keep track of the thin strips of reflective plastic that marked our route, numbered in the dashed script of Joy's uncle, and a final person remind everyone to take breaks, eat, and change batteries if any headlamps dimmed. For a second at the start, we fell into long-established outdoor roles. On hikes, I led with Joy at my heels, cautioning me to find our path, at times correcting me, harsh-tailed. The cave, though, demanded hierarchy. Joy, whose uncle took her caving as a kid, took charge leaving Harsh and I to trade spots in her wake. While the markers ran out, hundreds of feet and multiple turns between one and then next, he stopped us often, pointing out stunning tiny deposits of growing stalactite or hollows of chiseled crystal crustaceans. At first, Joy would check her paper again, but then she tired of worrying her notes, angering or perhaps frightening Harsh, though we would each time arrive at the next sequential number. Down, down into the dark, through markers three and four, seven, nine, ten, the curious faint Midwestern lilt of her voice and the caution in his Brahmin English enveloped me. I felt as if my own hungers were hidden, as were the other unpleasant aspects of our fractured, nature-obsessed lives. Later on, when I would find a way to shed the day, our separation, 30 feet past marker 12, would force slowness into my racing mind. 12 and 13, I peeled delicately in my own mind so as not to tear what lay beneath memory. It, 12, my stopping place, was a stunning small cavern below which lurked injurious but not life-threatening falls. Beyond us at 13, a place where harsh followed joy into a, a challenge at which I balked, there was real danger. There, below a five-foot horizontal stem, the width of a body bent at the knees, there was such a long chasm that one slip could lead at worst to death and at best to a three-day rescue that would endanger a whole crew. Traversing the unknown was an enduring habit between us, between me and my couple friends, Joy Wells and Harsh Parika. Together for 16 years. What had I done for 16 years, day in and day out? Brush my teeth? Joy took the lead after 12. Harsh had gone silent behind me, waiting. But Joy talked me forward into a tricky, twisting climb up to the chasm. While I rested, peering into the darkness, he lifted himself into the shadows behind me. As soon as he entered the rest spot, Joy stepped out. 
She found her first hand in footholds, lowered her body the foot and a half downward, and placed her back against the opposing wall. Inch by inch, tension alone holding her safe above the abyss, she stemmed her way across. Lot in her stead, I looked backward and saw Harsh close his eyes. I would be unable to say, then as now, if I hated him for having the feeling that closed his eyes against her adrenaline urges, or if I wanted it for myself. I watched him, watching Joy. These footholds aren't great, she said from the other side, sucking water and brushing strands of loose hair from her face, where they tangled in the straps of her helmet. Behind me, I could feel Harsh relax his hand against my hip, his breath close to my neck. Joy had tilted her headlamp into the dark space between that separated us from her. Even with a beam, all that was visible was narrowing, descending walls that swallowed the light. Her headlamp shone into the darkest stretch I'd yet seen. Or maybe my imagination filled it in that way, fear and black, we'd think. I looked to the wall, tracing her route with my eyes, but seeing nothing. And by the time she looked up at us, his body had already shifted perceptibly away from me. If you fall, she didn't end the sentence, but she was on the good side of it, smiling beneath her pale blue helmet. As if I disappeared, Harsh spoke. I'm ready, he said. I flattened against the rock, out of his way. At one time, Harsh was nobody in particular to me, an outdoor fiend like so many others. We had rafted the Colorado together, all of us, and while he was never the first arrogant motherfucker to strip off his shirt and dive into the cold water, he was always there in the pack, until he wasn't just there. Watching him coalesce into a person in my life was terrifying, more terrifying than any life or death move I could make in nature. His hand brushing my hip, his breath close to my face. As he stepped into the passage, I mimicked him, squeezing my eyes shut, but I couldn't. A love gesture felt like shit on me. I blinked open and watched him, mind dumb, seeing and processing nothing. Whatever joy was to her boyfriend that made him unable to look when she crossed and then follow her. They didn't look any more right than I felt at that moment. For Harsh, the traverse was easy. I meant to look for where his feet were going so that I could match his steps. And I caught the last stretch onto solid ground, but closing my eyes, it cost me the chance to copy his first foothold, the crucial step that sets the body up for success all the way across. I stared down at the rocks, trying to read them, to figure it out, wondering if backing away was failure to me. Was I giving up on myself? Surrendering to the fact that this was my first time, or that I didn't have Joy's fatalism or her patience, or that my arm span measured half of Harsh's. We'd compared them once, both holding out our limbs sideways like giant birds, forgotten by time and evolution. Kaka! Someone in the group called out. Someone else laughed at us. But only Joy's laughter melted away the cocoon of her sleeping bag, and the sounds of wild night insects and curious mammals lost their usual rapture of meaning as our careless conversation wandered into intimacy right while she stared at us. I don't know what we talked about. I couldn't replicate it here. Neither of us could undo our odd closeness then, documented by joy, looking at us as if by accident, then smug. I had no idea what we looked like to her. Two people, I suppose. I think I meant to put the flat of my palm against her shoulder to bring her close. I missed her, though, and snapped the tree beside us. Angry, asked the guy who happened to be between our bodies. Could be, I said, staring at Joy as Harsh passed into the night. My headlamp was looking kind of brown, like the lights in our house when I was young, and the electricity was about to conk out. Goddamn Houston power, my mom would say, slamming around into table legs and drawers until she found the flashlight. And there was never a time when she thought to put one in an easy-to-find place. Always the same routine. Waiting there in the dark, thinking of mom, reminded me to conserve light. I fumbled with the headlamp buttons until I found the right combination of clicks to turn it off. There, I found fear again, the darkest there was on Earth, darker, darker than anything except maybe death. That was a thing after the silence. In that instant of shutting off my headlamp and plunging into the vastest absence of light I'd ever know, alive, it was not as if I'd closed my eyes or as if the power had gone on the fritz, or even as if I'd gone under a wave 50 yards from shore in some enchanted ocean. The cave dark into which I plunged when I turned off my headlamp was pre-nascent darkness. Womb darkness, burial darkness, death darkness. The unmemorable past and the unknowable future reposed in the dark of a cave. Names raced through my mind. Blood dark, like deep inside a heart. 
I thought too melodramatic. Brain dark, like thoughts that never surface. Too depressing. Hard dark, like you can't see your own hand in front of your face until it brushes your nose. And even then, it doesn't feel like your own flesh because without seeing it, you can't quite believe it exists. I liked the sound of that one, but it felt ecstatic. And this darkest place was dreadful and broad and alluring. No transcending this. For all it took me in, the darkness revealed nothing. I didn't come to Jesus or figure myself out. It was more like some holy, ultimate, inner letting go, reckoning upon an absence I never knew existed. For all I knew, here, said the universe to me, there's something you don't know yet. But I knew too many things. I knew that being unfaithful meant, to me, that one person fails to abide by the rules of one relationship by joining another in a deceitful way. I knew that roles like leader and follower are harder to define when bodies can join than when they remain distant, and that after the loving starts, deciding who led and who followed along is impossible because lovers are precisely those whose actions go unrecorded. No inner truth hid in that dark, although I could not have avoided thinking about the three of us alone down there. Joy and I, Harsh and I, they two together without me. I'm not wicked. Maybe I want to believe the thing I saw inside darkness was what we were wrestling for in each other. Realness, relentless, a thing striking none of us in our above ground lives. Western legend found it where outlaws supposedly hit about hid their loot and never been found. They did it, so I forgot. Um, yeah, there's so much mythology in so many places, caves and, and high school classrooms. And <laughs> <laughs> I did have a question for Jennifer. It was something that struck me, and I don't know if it's just an odd thing, and maybe you can tell me if you have any way to respond to this question, but you have very specific times.
I enjoyed that cave story. I don't have the uh, have neither the physical strength nor the bravery to do that kind of stuff. So it's uh, inspiring actually to hear that. I feel really fortunate to the community of cavers who taught me and, and um, there's oh, kind of an apprenticeship type world around activities like that because they're so obscure and so few people want to do them for all the reasons you mentioned. Um, so. Thank our, our two readers here again. 